Okay, so here we go. So, yeah, so before we get to, to Randy's talk, we'll just go through um, a brief kind of announcements and business meeting for the Midnight Sun Flycasters. I know a lot of folks who are tuning in, you know, are part of that group there, but we'll, we'll, so we'll try to keep things brief and we'll just go through a few things and then hand it over to Randy. Um, so if you're not familiar with the Midnight Sun Flycasters, um, it's Interior Alaska's uh, basically only fly fishing club. Uh, it was established in 1976. And the goals of the club are to share knowledge, develop and refine skills and promote fly fishing and fish conservation in Interior Alaska. And uh, my name is Kevin Fraley. I'm the um, current president of the, the club this year. And we've got some other great officers this year that despite um, you know, all the COVID challenges, we've been able to, to do some great virtual meetings and events. So, um, so like I said, yeah, we, we meet um, from September to April usually, um, and that's monthly meetings. This year they've been virtual over Zoom. And each of those meetings, typically we have a, a great guest speaker like Randy this month. Um, to talk about some aspect of fish ecology or fly fishing or conservation. Um, some of the other activities that our group does, we do uh, an annual kids camp, um, which you can see a picture of there on the, the top left. And that's a, um, a multi-day camp um, near Fairbanks each summer that's put on for kids from age 10 to 16 and their guardian to come and learn about fly fishing. That includes uh, fly casting, fly tying, fish ID, um, insect ID, lots of uh, great stuff in that camp. So. If you know of a, a kid that is in, would be interested in learning fly fishing, definitely check that out. You can find info on that on our website and whatnot. Um, we have a couple of social media accounts. Check us out on Facebook and Twitter and our website if you are interested in the club and uh, want more information. And the memberships are really cheap, 25 bucks for an individual or a family. And um, that money goes towards the activities like the kids camp. We're a nonprofit group, so it's nothing's for profit here. Um, some other events the club does, periodic stream cleanups, uh, fly casting clinics that Fred runs sometimes, and then fly tying nights, and once in a while, um, you know, fishing get togethers, although those have been limited during COVID times. Um, so just a few announcements before we get to, to Randy's um, presentation. So some local um, developments, you know, if you're fishing around the, the Fairbanks, North Pole area, just be aware that um, there's an emergency order that was recently released that closed um, Ileson Air Force Base and North Pole Lakes um, to, or change it mostly to catch and release fishing. I think one of them's closed and that's due to uh, contamination by this chemical called PFAS that gets in the water and into the fish. So um, definitely if you fish those areas, keep that in mind, check that emergency order. It's not in the, the regular regulations. So make sure you check those. Also right now, the BLM Central Yukon um, Draft Resource Management Plan and Environmental Impact Statement is open for comment and that's until March 11th. And basically if you recreate or fish um, anywhere like along the Dalton Highway Corridor or BLM lands in the North Slope, there's even some Denali Borough lands there in this giant um, plan and, and you have you know some input or thoughts on it, definitely check that out. There's um, a fair number of changes they're proposing in there and you can get comments in on that. Also the Arctic Yukon Kuskokwim um, sport fish regulation proposals is open until May. So if you think that certain regulations should be changed in that region, or you've got some ideas, you can definitely put together a proposal for that. Check that out. Um, for the club, we've got a few events upcoming. We may do another socially distanced stream cleanup of the Chena River and Badger Sloughs in May, and that's where people can go out at their own leisure um, or in small, in small groups within your bubble, if that's what you're comfortable with, and clean up the Chena River and the Badger Slough and kind of you know make things look pretty in these, these waters that we fish and, and spend time around. Um, we're also thinking about doing maybe a one day kids fly fishing class partnering with the folk school possibly. Um, if any members are interested in volunteering for that we are kind of garnering interest to see if that that can be feasible. You don't have to be a casting expert or anything but if you just want to help out or you know help out on fish ID or something like that we may end up doing that um, in May. And then like I mentioned the kids camp that's June 11th through 13th at Lost Lake Boy Scout camp near Salcha. Um, for next month's meeting we're, I haven't totally confirmed yet, but we're um, hopefully going to get uh, Dan Hardy of D-Ray Personal Guide Service out of Anchorage to talk about uh, some of his awesome fishing that he does out in the Christmas Islands or Kiribati. Um, he's a, a guide in Anchorage there too. He does some, uh, he catches some amazing rainbow trout on the Kenai. I uh, ran into him a couple times in the Susitna and I've always admired his, his photos and um, definitely very interested in, in uh, hearing his presentation. If he does um, end up giving that. I still need to confirm final details with him, but that'd be March 
10th at 6.30 p.m. So keep tuned, stay tuned for that. Just the last few announcements, we do have a new online membership purchase option and you get a free sticker and a member card with that. And we do have a few little merchandise items we're kind of trialing, selling to. So if you want a shot glass or a magnet or something, definitely pick one up. Um, and so with that, I will, that's pretty much all the announcements I had. I'll open it up to um, the floor of the membership and see if I missed anything. Um, and then I'll let Will, our vice president, go ahead and introduce um, Randy Brown for tonight's presentation. Yeah, Kevin, this is uh, Dave Vig. Yeah, you touch on, but uh, the 2021 memberships uh, are now due. Uh, I think there's been about a dozen of that have paid for, for this year, but uh, you can either do it online or mail it to our PO box. Cool. Thanks, Dave. Will, anything you have before we move on to Randy? No. Okay. Uh, Kevin, uh, this is Fred. Hey, Fred. Um, often, um, most years I've uh, done like a preseason casting tune-up uh, in May uh, that it's all open to club members. And it's just one evening uh, down at the pump house. And uh, I'm planning to do that again. I'm not sure of the date yet, but uh, we can talk about that. But okay. just so you're aware that uh, I'll be uh, doing just a a casting class and working with folks uh, one evening in May. That's great. Yeah, one of our new members did email me to see if there would be a class like that. So that's great, great news. Thanks, Fred. Okay, Will, I'm gonna hand it off to you so you can introduce Randy. Yeah, so Randy's a little bit of a local legend around Fairbanks, um, a longtime resident. For those of you who don't know, he's quite the sourdough. Um, he spent some time living um, subsist a subsistence lifestyle up off the Yukon River for, for years when he was young and came to Alaska, um, after which he moved back to Fairbanks and, and moved his family back to town and got his degrees at UAF, I believe both a, an undergraduate and master's degree at UAF. Um, and afterwards started working for, for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So um, I thought Randy would be an excellent speaker. I heard him speak years ago about Dolly Varden up in Anwar, and it was, it was a fantastic talk. So I'm pretty excited about this. He's, he's a sharp guy. Um, his scientific excellence has, has won him the, the Rachel Carson Award recently and an honorary doctorate degree from UAF. So, so definitely a great, great scientist and speaker to have with us today. Um, with that, I'll leave it to you, Randy. Thanks. Uh, well, thank you for that introduction. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Well, so uh, get this thing started here now. Okay. Um, so, um, Appreciate everybody being here today. I'm gonna to talk about some of the recent sheepish research that I've been involved with in one way or another since I began working with uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service in the mid 1990s. This is a photo of a nice sheepish on the Kobuk River spawning area a few years ago. And I do want to acknowledge uh, those that came before uh, us many of uh, many those of us of my generation most prominently Ken Alt as well as some of the primary organizations that supported us in our research efforts the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service the um, um, Office of Subsistence Management and the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. My work with she fish began back in 1996 at a place called Rapids on the Yukon River just upstream from the mouth of the Tanana River about 730 miles from the sea. I had a job with the US Fish and Wildlife Service and was working on a chum salmon mark recapture project at the site. Hang on a second, I'm gonna see if I can shut this video off here. Let's see, there it is. Okay. Um, Anyway, at that, Stanzare had been hired to help us catch fall chum salmon in his fish wheel that we would then mark with spaghetti tags and release. Ah, doggone it. Stanzare 
Stan outfitted his fish wheel to be gentle on fish and they were guided to the live box for holding before we tagged them. We'd, we'd net them out of the live box, measure them and tag them with numbered spaghetti tags before releasing them back into the river. We'd do 450 of these guys every day uh, for about six weeks in the fall every year. We were working with radio tags too. And I worked with John Eiler with the National Marine Fisheries Service to set up remote radio receiving stations along the Yukon River and its major tributaries upstream all through Canada. This is a tower located about seven miles upstream from the tagging site. Now these stations recorded the upstream or downstream migrations of radio tagged fish and were powered by solar panels and batteries and transmitted passage data to a GOES satellite every day. The thing about fish wheels is that they catch all fish migrating along the river. And by mid-August, we were seeing 50 to 80 sheepfish going through the fish wheels every day. At one point during the project, John Burr, the sport fish manager for ADF and G for the Yukon River at the time, commented to us that we should figure out where they were going. That really intrigued me and I pursued it and ultimately got support for a multi-pronged project based out of rapids. I began sampling the subsistence catch at Rapids in 1997 during my spare time. When I was finished measuring and weighing them and collecting their odalis, I'd split them and hang them for whoever shared their catch with me. It became clear that we were seeing a spawning run. All of the females had massive egg skeins that were 20 to 30% of whole, their whole body weight. There can be as much as 200,000 to 400,000 eggs for each female. Consistent with other data, we found that males were notably smaller on average than females. For those not familiar with metric measurements, 60 centimeters is about two feet long and 90 centimeters is about three feet long. Later when doing work on the Kobuk and Selawick River populations, we were able to show that the Yukon fish of both sexes were considerably smaller than they were in Northwest Alaska populations. I started a radio telemetry program with the sheepfish in 1997. Ken Alt had done some radio telemetry work in the area with these fish a couple of decades before, but the technology was less advanced at that time and he didn't have the towers along the river to help him. We tried this externally balanced attachment that required two wires under the dorsal musculature. It looked great to me, but the fish didn't like it at all and few even tried to proceed upstream after tagging. We also tried the salmon model of pushing a tag through the mouth into the stomach. Similar to salmon, sheepfish don't eat during their spawning migrations. And so we figured that it would be the least intrusive method to use. The sheepfish didn't seem to mind the antenna sticking out of their mouths and all but a few that were recaptured in the fish wheel continued their migration. Now sheepfish survived spawning, so we worried to some extent that the tag might create an eating problem for them if they couldn't purge them somehow. But we'd seen some with good sized rocks in their stomach, such as this photo from April Bear with ADF and G. Maybe they can digest food with the stones in their stomachs, otherwise they would have to purge them or die. We eventually developed methods to anesthetize and surgically implant radio tags into sheepfish with the antenna routed out behind the pelvic girdle. We would then sew them up with a suture and follow them around for years. This particular tag was able to transmit for over five years. We then follow the tag fish in the drainage with the towers and with uh, aerial telemetry surveys. The initial project from the rapids included a tower just upstream and the towers on the main stem above the Yukon Flats upstream from Circle and on the Porcupine River. That way we'd be able to narrow the scope of our aerial flights. We tagged fish in August and early September and none had gone upstream past the Yukon Flats on the main stem or the Porcupine by late September. And we were expecting them to spawn in late September, early October. We began flying from the downstream side and surveyed all the different rivers that flow into the flats one after another. On the third day of flying after not hearing any fish up to that point, we were ready to fly the Porcupine River, but when we got there, the Porcupine River was all fogged in. So we flew the main stem from Fort Yukon to Circle. They were all in the Yukon River main stem, <coughs> excuse me, in that upper Yukon Flats. 
We tagged fish three different years in the late 1990s and all three years they went to the same region. This is what the Upper Yukon Flats looks like. It gets to be over three miles wide from the north to south banks with many different channels. The water flows fast. The islands are composed of gravel and sand for the most part. And it is like this for the entire 80 mile reach. <clears throat> of course, we had to go out and verify in early October. These were my coworkers at the time, Riley Morris driving and Thomas McDonough taking the picture and me wielding the telemetry rig. We'd search and find our tag she fish in various places where the current was a little less than in the middle of the river and set beach seines around them where we could. And we caught she fish, including one of our radio tag fish. We also caught spawning humpback whitefish in Bering Cisco. We recognized that this was a major spawning area for the whitefish. As part of the initial sampling program that began in 1997, we collected otoliths to age the she fish. We'd use grinders and other processing tools to cut sections from the middle of each otolith, then glue those sections to a slide and look at them with a microscope. Similar to tree rings, annual growth increments are visible in otoliths. This fish was aged as a 10 year old fish. This is a nice image of a fish we aged at 29 years old. Annuli are indicated with the white dots on this one. And this is the oldest she fish we've seen. My colleague Bill Carter collected the otolith from the Selawick River she fish and prepared this specimen. We aged it at 41 years old. The Yukon Flats population I sampled in the 1990s didn't achieve that kind of age. That population began maturing at seven years of age with males generally maturing about a year or so younger than females. And the oldest fish we sampled were females. Using the chemistry of fish otoliths to identify fish captured in fresh water that had previously migrated to sea was a relatively new technology when I began this work with she fish. Ken Alt was pretty sure the upper Yukon she fish migrated to sea, but I was going to put that to the test. The basic idea was that otoliths are primarily calcium carbonate. And when fish are in a high strontium environment, such as the ocean, they incorporate much more strontium into the precipitating part of the otolith than when they are in a low strontium environment, such as more freshwater rivers. This is a histogram of the strontium calcium molar ratios in over 700 rivers around the world in yellow, freshwater lakes in white, and the marine system in blue. There are a few rivers with very high strontium calcium molar ratios, but the Yukon River has a ratio of about two millimoles per mole, much lower than marine water. So I worked with Ken Severn, the director of the Advanced Instrumentation Lab up at the university and used an electron microprobe to analyze strontium concentrations across the growth history and otolith sections. These spots along this transect are five microns in diameter and go from the core of the otolith across all the growth increments to the margin. This is a strontium profile from, the anadromous, from an anadromous she fish from the Yukon Flats population indicating that it went to sea annually through life. The yellow dash line indicates the level above which indicates marine presence. Each one of the big peaks in strontium concentration indicates a migration into the sea. All of the she fish we tested from the Yukon Flats population were anadromous and had gone to sea early in life. Another more striking way to look at the strontium profiles is to create a map of the strontium distribution across the whole surface of the otolith. In this image, the orange areas are low in strontium and reflect time spent in freshwater, and the bright yellow bands are high in strontium and reflecting time spent in the sea. This she fish went back and forth annually until I captured it at Rapids in 1997. After she fish eggs are broadcast into the water and are fertilized, they sink to the bottom and become entrained in cracks and holes in the gravel. There they incubate through the winter, hatch in late winter, and emerge into the water column as breakup begins. At emergence, they're about the size of this larval she fish image drawn by Betsy Sturm, about one and a quarter inches long. Betsy documented the development of a large number of fish species from egg to young fish, including she fish, when she was in graduate school at UAF. These young she fish and other similarly small white fishes get taken downstream by the river to wherever it flows. 
If it floods a flats, some of the young fish go there. If it backs up into a wetland, some of the fish go there. If they stay with the main flow until it's at the sea, that's where they go. The survivors eventually mature and return upstream spawn. At the same time as I was pursuing this work with sheepfish, colleagues of mine, Tevis Underwood and Dave Dom, were working with Stan Zeray to install a video system on the fish wheel to streamline the capture, recapture events and other aspects of fish monitoring at the fish wheel. The system would record nothing until a fish was captured and slipped through the chute into the live box. From that point on, the system took pictures of every fish that went through the fish wheel every summer for about 15 years. It had sufficient resolution to tell species and could identify the color of the spaghetti tags in chum salmon with a different color deployed every week. So the tag numbers were not essential at that point. And it, and it identified all the other fish as well. Whoops, whoops. So one of the tremendous benefits of this advancement was that we came away with a very clear understanding of the sheepish spawning migration timing at the site. This is a plot of sheepish numbers per day during the years 2001 to 2005, illustrating that prior to mid-August or so, only an occasional sheepish was flying the river. But from mid-August until late September, the spawning run of sheepish was coming through the fish wheel at 50 to 80 fish a day or more. In the early 2000s, we knew the locations of four sheepish spawning areas, and we knew that another existed in the Salukna River and the upper Nuitna River. Another was suspected in the Salmon Fork, <coughs> Drondrick or Black River, indicated with the open circle, a tributary of the Porcupine River. John Burr and I mobilized a number of other telemetry projects in the Nuitna and Salukna Rivers initially, and the Anoko River after that. Then I worked with Andy Griska with ADF and G on sheafish captured in the Tanana River. We eventually located sheafish spawning areas in the Salukna, Inoko, and Tanana Rivers. The Salukna spawning area meanders through a wide forested valley, quite different than the Yukon Flats spawning area. Once, lo once we located the Salukna River spawning reach, the population was studied by my colleagues, John Gurkin with the US Fish and Wildlife Service and Dave Essie with BLM. John more clearly defined the upstream and downstream bounds of the spawning area from the ground and studied details of the habitat, while Dave Essie deployed an imaging sonar to count the post spawners leaving the system. This is Dave's sonar site in early October. He ran the sonar for two years, counting about 2000 fish one year and about 3,500 fish the next year. Most fish migrated downstream at night and most of them back down tail first. That was a surprise. Most sheafish fish spawning areas don't allow viewing fish from the air. They're either turbid with silt or stained from tundra runoff. A notable exception is the Kobuk River, which is clear in the late fall with a light substrate. So large schools of sheafish fish like this are visible. The age data has been collected recently for three populations in the Yukon River, the Alatna, the Salukna, and the Yukon Flats. Age data from mature fish can be used to estimate annual survival for the population. The left side of the age histogram builds until all or nearly all of the fish are mature, and the decline off the right side of the histogram reflects mortality acting on the age classes as depicted in the yellow curves in this image. The Alatna River population appears to experience the greatest mortality with only about four of every 10 fish surviving from one year to the next. By contrast, more than eight of every 10 fish in the Salakna River population survive from one year to the next. The Yukon River population fits right in the middle. These data suggest that the Salakna River population does not expose itself to the same level of exploitation as either the Yukon or Alatna populations. Perhaps they don't make the migration to see as often as the others and thus avoid the mortality that would entail. The Anoko River is a giant flatwater system in the lower Yukon drainage. 
For over 200 miles in the middle stretch of the river, the channel ranges from 20 to 50 feet deep or more and drops off steeply right from shore. It has minimal current, abundant zooplankton throughout, large numbers of whitefish of all ages, and osprey nests abound. In many ways, it's much more like a linear lake than a river. Ken Alt had worked in the Inoko extensively decades before and tagged sheafish there, some of which were later captured in the Yukon. So it was his thought that they didn't spawn in the Inoko. We saw it as an ideal location to radio tag sheafish as a way to test whether additional large spawning areas were present upstream in the Yukon. We got funding for the project and drove boats down there to do the tagging work. This is an image of the southwest edge of the Iditarod Flats, 150 miles upstream from the Anoka River mouth. So this is a topo map of the Anoko River with the Iditarod Flats in the red circle. When the Yukon water level gets high, this whole flats becomes flooded. The river channels disappear and all you see are these tundra clumps here and there with a few black spruce trees on them. There's a big barge sitting out in the tundra in one place. Way before GPS came along, it had been delivering goods to the mining camps in the upper Iditarod River and encountered a flooded flats, lost the channel and got stuck. And then the water went down. It is a wild place. Our telemetry data indicated a likely spawning area in the headwaters of the Inoko, almost 450 miles from the mouth of the river, it was almost a thousand miles from the Hall Road Bridge to the spawning site, but we had to go and confirm it. When John Burr and I were debating how to get there and sample the population, we thought, what would Ken do? We knew he would load up his boat in Fairbanks and drive there. We decided to follow Ken's lead, but go from the bridge instead. We picked up a couple of colleagues in Shagla and a community in the lower Inoko and two smaller skiffs from the Inoko Refuge Field Camp for the final 150 miles. The spawning area was unusual in that all the fish appeared to be in one big pool rather than spread around in a larger reach of the river like other spawning areas we'd seen. Four of us sampled 100 she fish in the pool in about three and a half hours without ever catching the same fish twice. We measured each fish, confirmed they were preparing to spawn, and took genetic samples. We then fished similar looking pools upstream and downstream and never caught a fish. At that point, we were able to confirm six spawning populations in the Alaska side of the drainage. The spawning area in the main stem Kayakuk River appeared to have merged with the larger Latin River population, since all of our radio tags that entered the Kayakuk River migrated to the Alatna River and did not stop in the Kayakut. Additionally, Andy Griska identified a spawning area in the braided main stem of the Tanana River between the mouths of the Chena and Salcher Rivers. Knowing where these populations spawned allows, allowed us to catch, uh, to collect population-specific genetic samples. We ended up getting genetic samples from all but the Chattanooga River spawning population, and Jeff Olson with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Genetics Lab conducted an analysis of them. He found that the Alatna, Yukon Flats, and Tanana River populations were closely related, and the Selukna and Inoka River populations were closely related. Those two groups, however, were distant from each other. For context, this is a map of the known spawning areas of Chinook salmon in the drainage. We don't really understand why sheafish have so few spawning areas compared to Chinook salmon and other species, but it does highlight the importance of these habitats since virtually all of the sheafish we encounter from the Yukon Flats downstream comes from one or another of these populations. So the different sheafish spawning areas appear to be wildly different from each other. They are in large rivers and small rivers, braided systems and meandering systems, clear water and turbid water, the most obvious visual similarities among them are flowing water and gravel substrate. Now I know you folks in this crowd are more interested in fishing for these she fish than all the research findings I presented, so I have some guidance on that as well. During most of the summer, she fish can be found where freshwater streams flow into the silty Yukon or Tanana rivers. This is the mouth of the Zitsiana River on the lower Tanana, where it merges with the silty water in a slough off the main river. Sheafish will hang out near the interface in nearly all of these tributaries, as well as some distance upstream. 
The braided spawning region, the Yukon River pictured here and the Tanana River are occupied by large numbers of sheep fish in late September and early October. These are pretty intimidating areas for many people, but if you're skilled in boating in these types of environments, they can offer great adventure. While the Yukon and Tanana rivers are silty in the summer, they begin to clear a bit by early October. The Alaska Department of Fish and Game conducted a mark recapture program for Bering Cisco a few years ago using electroshocker boats to capture the fish. I was along for some of the work, and when we got over a school of she fish, they came up too. We pulled off the shock and when we encountered them and they moved out of the way. Some of the crew went out with hook and line gear during their off days and were able to catch she fish pretty handily. Even though they aren't eating, they still strike. The she fish and other whitefish species spawning areas attract other species as well. Egg eaters like lake chubs and round whitefish and fish predators like burbot and northern pike abound in these spawning areas along with the, the whitefishes. And of course, the rarely observed trout perch are also common in the Yukon Flats spawning area. The weather can get kind of gnarly there at that time of year. So you have to be prepared if you venture into the flats after big she fish. Well, I hope knowing more about she fish life history and migration dynamics makes the experience of catching them a little richer for everybody here. Thanks a lot for having me. I suppose I can take questions if that's it's in the making there. Thanks a lot, Randy. That's awesome. Um, let's open it up for, for questions. If anybody's got anything, go ahead and jump in. Yeah, Randy, do you know what they're eating? The the she fish when they're in fresh water? Are they picky? Um are, are they targeting one species? Do you know any research about that? Well, Ken did a bunch of work on diet and uh, they, they, are, they eat pretty much anything they encounter. Certain times of the year when certain fish are moving through, they'll be eating them and other times of year, it'll be, it'll be uh, something else. I know uh, there was a project in the winter uh, up out of uh, Kotzebue where a, a couple of the young men there um, wanted to do a science fair project for their high school. And they went out and to see if the she fish were eating out there and they were eating, um, you know, saffron cod and, and uh, Pacific herring and pretty much everything that was present in that Northern part of Hotham Inlet. And, and I'm sure that when these she fish are out in the, in the marine areas, they're eating whatever comes around there too. That's winter. You still keep in close contact with uh, Stan Zaray. I got to meet him when I visited Tan and I. He's a great guy. Yeah, Stan is great, and uh, and I still keep in touch with him. I still go out there. He's been he's had a platform for a lot of uh, a lot of our work over the years uh, as a capture platform for all these species because his his fish wheel doesn't kill him, and uh, and and then you you have you have it you know bearing Cisco or she fish or um, whatever it is you're looking for. As far as the fish wheels go, are, is there a lot of subsistence harvest of sheep fish out there in the Yukon as compared to some of the other rivers where sheep fish are harvested sub, with subsistence? I, I wouldn't expect there'd be much sport fishing or, or um, fishing pole fishing like, like we're used to out there, is there? Oh, there is. Um, you know, most people that do um, hook and line fishing are going to these uh, uh, freshwater rivered mouths, you know, and uh, and catching fish there, you know, where the fresh and the silt water comes together. But the uh, the any salmon net set into the river is going to be uh, catching uh, she fish as well as the, as the fish wheels. The fish wheels are really efficient at it, uh, and I think the she fish mostly swim up near shore, and so they get channeled into them pretty effectively. But uh, I know at rapids, those fish wheels, they catch a lot of sheep fish anytime they're fishing in the fall. There was a question from Brendan that asks, do you know anything about where they go when they're in salt water? No, um, I don't think anybody's really looked at that. I know 
in this sometimes in the summer there or in the early year uh, in the summer they will move up along the coast to the north um, they used to have a test fishing project there on um, on the island just north of uh, of uh, Kotlik there and uh, and there would be sheepfish going through there uh, but under ice um, and I don't know whether it's getting solid enough ice these these years for it to uh, uh, really coalesce there but you get if you get ice so the wind isn't mixing it, you get a freshwater layer under the ice that extends way out. And, uh, and then you could have a brackish water area that might go 50 or 100 miles offshore, I'm sure. And uh, so that is, uh, um, I think all of that habitat would be open to their uh, exploiting for whatever sort of a marine fish is present in that environment. I know um, with, you know, I work for the Wildlife Conservation Society and we do some work on uh, like coastal lagoons, you know, up towards Kivalina and then down at Bering Land Bridge. Um, and there's also sea fish that show up in those lagoons too. So they definitely seem to to range north along the coast there for feeding or whatever they're they're up to. Yeah, and the thing about these sea fish is that they can't be out in full salt under the ice because it's too cold. You know, with the the freezing point depression of salt water, it, it goes down to uh, about minus one point seven Celsius. And their uh, uh, fluids without without antifreeze proteins can take them down to about minus zero point six five or something like that. And uh, so I think brief stints they could handle, but it would have to be pretty brief. There's a couple more questions in the chat here. So uh, Brenda's asked, why do you hypothesize that marine migration would cause more mortality? I think that it would cause more mortality, mostly because of the freshwater migration that that would have to ensue to get back to the spawning areas. Um, and uh, the, they are captured in under the ice fisheries at the mouth, though. And all a bunch of our radio tags that we put out in the Inoko. So these Inoko fish, they went up to the Alatna, they went up to the Yukon Flats, they went into the Salakna River. We didn't have any go into the Tananoff, but. Um, but they would then turn around after they finished spawning and they would migrate right back down and they would be, a lot of them were being caught in under the ice fisheries at the mouth. And that's the way we knew they were down there because we didn't have, um, you know, telemetry capacity uh, to, to, to deal with that depth of water or the brackish water system. But uh, most of our harvest happened down in the mouth. So the mortality is when they migrate back up and have to pass all the salmon nets and fish wheel. That's what I think. So you were getting um, fish that you tag reported in from fishermen, that's what you're saying that were? Yes. Accepting? Gotcha, okay. Um, and so do those Tanana River fish, are they also going out to sea, do you know, or are they more of a? So both the Tanana and the uh, Salakna River, um, there were some anadromous fish in, in the samples we did, but, but very few. And it looked like they uh, didn't go down on a regular basis, so. You know, I mean, we didn't do a big enough sample to be able to estimate the proportion, but but it looks it was you know the Yukon was all of them, the Alatna River was eight out of ten that we sampled, and so um, I think they don't go down there quite as much, and the 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 Selukna River population that we tagged those with uh, with long duration tags, and uh, and I flew them in the winter. They all leave the Nuitna, and they go down into they spend the most of them spend the winter just in the main stem Yukon, they're in the islands in front of the Nuitna, and actually they were down all the way to uh, Nulato in the river, just out in the main river, and they were there in uh, November, and they were there the next April, and then they would migrate back into the Nuitna. So they're avoiding the big fishery by not even going down and having to fly the, the river. That's what I think. That's good. And the Alatna, I mean, they have, uh, there's a, um, a beach seine fishery that goes up there, a uh, subsistence fishery out of Alakakit and Alatna. So I think that that plays a role in their uh, low survival. Okay. There's uh, another question from Denny. Um, what is the northernmost river with she fish? Hi, Denny. Uh, yeah, in, uh, in Alaska anyway, it's the Kobuk, uh, as far as I know. I know they, they sort of wander into the no attack a little bit, but we haven't ever found a, a spawning population there. And um, I'm not sure, I don't think nobody ever knows about one that up the coast any, and, and we don't have them on the north side. Uh, Mackenzie has, has them though, and Northern Russia has them. So, but that's Alaska. 
Yeah, hey, fellas, I can follow up on that a little bit. I worked in the McKenzie Delta, um, and I, they're a reasonably common occurrence off the subsistence fisheries on the North Slope there on the Yukon side and, and right out to Herschel Island on occasion. Um, so, you know, I don't think they wrap all the way around, but those are pro those are likely McKenzie fish. I don't think we're aware of any um, that exist in the Yukon North Slope rivers until you get maybe over towards the Delta a little more. Uh, there might be some river populations there off the north coast but that we're not really aware of them but um they're certainly reasonably common out as far as herschel island um one of the questions i had for you randy um is um we don't we, uh, so when i worked in the mckenzie delta fish wheels aren't really a thing there um and I, I one of the things i'm not clear on with with fish wheels um very well is sort of what's the minimum flow speed required to get one of those to operate well enough to catch the difference and does it vary by species like are you more likely to get um the whitefish species at a lower speed or the do you need a little bit quicker turn for the conies or how does how, what's your take on that well i don't i don't really know i know i know that um in real slow water people don't like uh running fish wheels uh so they like some current and yeah. that's it takes that current to turn them and um i i'm there, there are differing opinions on whether to run them fast or whether to run them slow. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, I think that's like, you know, saying you want big dogs or small dogs, you know, or I don't know. Yeah, okay. Because the, like the Mackenzie Delta is quite slow, but there are a couple of tributaries there, the Peel and the, and the Arctic Red River that uh, are probably quick enough to do it. And when I was working up there, uh, it was a tempting idea that I was interested in, but there's just no real institutional local knowledge about how to operate and build them. So it never really got off the ground, but it's something that I still talk to those guys about and, you know, try to push that idea because I think they could really replicate some of the work that you've done over there um, and can clean up some of the, the knowledge that we don't have in the McKenzie system about, about 20 years of fish. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for that. Uh, I've been over to, uh, Port McPherson on the Peel yeah. and, and went down Plastic Clavic one time on a canoe trip. But I th think the Peel, though not near as big as the ones on the Yukon. But, yeah. but if you want to get some resources on that, uh, Stan's Array has a website uh, called Rapids Research Center. Okay. And if you go there, you, you'll find films of them and directions and all sorts of stuff from the time he spent uh, working there. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. yeah. Cool. There's a couple other questions in the chat here. Uh, when I was over uh, in New Zealand, the, the fish biologists over there actually were able to build some fish wheels to catch sea run salmon over there. So I guess they must have found some schemes for it somewhere, but I think it would certainly be possible. Um, so Aaron asked, uh, hey, Randy, great job. Are she fish found in Russia? Also, what is their closest whitefish relative? <laughs> well, Yes, they are. Uh, they're, they're in the Anadir, and they're also in several other rivers on the north side, uh, the, the bigger rivers, uh, and uh, actually in the Caspian Sea, too. Although that one, I think, is being uh, um, perpetuated through uh, hatchery things because they put a dam on their river that they go up to spawn, but that's beside the point. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, um, and, and what was the second part of that question? Um, it was, what is the closest... Uh, whitefish relative. Oh. So, so the I think the only way to really deal with that issue is is by who they hybridize with, and I don't think they're intentionally spawning with another fish, but they there are all these uh, corgonids that all gather into into these spawning areas. So they hybridize with least cisco, and they hybridize with humpback whitefish, and uh, and so I think that those I would say that's their closest relatives. Yeah. We've seen them hybridize with broad whitefish in Mackenzie Delta as well. Have you? So down here, those are separated out by time. Uh, mm -hmm. Broad whitefish uh, in the Yukon are, are um, you know, they spawn in, in uh, late October, early November, where sheepfish are early. So that they don't have the same timing for in the Yukon or, the, or Northwest Alaska. So we haven't seen that. Yeah, Randy, this is... Uh... Fred, we uh, would occasionally find a uh, humpback whitefish sheepish hybrid up in Kotzebue or over at Sisolik. They, I think they had a local name for them, Igluic. Yeah. But, uh, anyway, those are the only ones I've ever seen up there. 
Well, we've seen them there. Ken uh, documented them in the in the Chattanooga River. Um, we saw them up the Kayakuk River. So I think it's pretty common. That way, at least it's not unusual. And I think they, they uh, uh, Jim Reist uh, and some others wrote a paper on hybrids up in the uh, uh, either Lower Mackenzie or Anderson River one time and had those mm -hmm. as the most common. Right, I, I remember reading that. I think it was the Anderson. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we've got another question in the chat here. It says, um, since you've handled a lot of she fish, any thoughts on how hardy they are? Any tips on safe live releases beyond the basic catch and release practice of wet hands and minimizing time out of the water? Well, I think those are important. I would say don't grab them by the gill and hold them up for a picture. <laughs> you want to support them because they're pretty heavy in there. I think they're pretty fragile. Yeah, that's a good point. If you're, you know, if you're fishing somewhere where they're in a, in a river on a spawning run, maybe try to use really heavy line to, to bring them in quick so you don't exhaust them. That's probably a good practice. Okay, I think that's most of the questions we got. Anybody else have anything? Oh, here's another uh, comment from Denny. I've heard whitefish are best eaten in the spring because they're full of fat. How are they if caught in the fall? <laughs> well, I think they're good at all times, but so the she fish that are going up to uh, the spawning migrations are in primo condition. They're very fat. So, how do you like to cook them? Or eat them? What's your favorite? I What's fry them. I'll fry. Hey, I, I cut them so there's no bones and I fry them. Okay, very cool. Well, well, thanks so much, Randy. I think uh, that looks like we're near the end of our questions, unless anybody has any last minute ones and wants to jump in here. Well, thanks very much for having me. Thanks a lot. This was great, really great info. I learned a ton and um, a lot of good info for us fishermen as well as just fish enthusiasts. So we really appreciate you uh, joining us. Well, thank you very much. All right, guys, well, I'll open it up for one last uh, round if anybody has any th uh, thoughts or anything else they want to bring up otherwise we'll close out the meeting hey randy this is donnie good uh good to see you um i had a quick question um okay. do you have any inclination or any or, or maybe observations or thoughts that the she fish might cross the or canadian border in the yukon and spawn in any waters on the yukon side or sorry the canadian side well, so there are she fish all the way up to uh, Lake Labarge and Tezan Lake and uh, in the Kluani system. Um, I don't think anybody knows where they spawn or whether it's multiple populations or one or um, so I think there's a lot of uh, that, that, that we don't know about the, the non anadromous populations. We did uh, Odalith chemistry work with a she fish caught in the Eagle area towards, uh, you know, upstream of where these anadromous fish uh, spawn in the Yukon Flats and also on the Porcupine. The porcupine, there's a, there's a spawning migration of she fish that go up there. And, and we sampled them and they were non-anadromous and they're definitely much smaller at age and at maturity than um, the, the anadromous ones. And same with the Yukon fish. But as to where they go, I don't know. And, but they are widely distributed in the upper drainage and it wouldn't surprise me if there are uh, two or three populations up there or maybe more. Very cool, thanks Randy. You bet. Okay, everybody. Well, thanks so much for tuning in. Um, thanks again, Randy, awesome presentation. And um, again, check out our Midnight Sun Flycasters if you have any interest in that in the area. And fly fishing and our like i said our next meeting will be in march um, check us out on our social media if you're interested in checking in uh, watching that presentation we're always um, happy to have the public tuning in so with that i will go ahead and uh, wrap up our meeting thanks a lot everybody have a good evening <laughs>